right here. By a show of hands, who bought this whole school just for steelhead night? Oh, that's not as many as I thought. Okay, who bought it for trout night? We're about, we're about even, okay. What I want to do, guys, you know how we got into the, when we got into the bass, we got into the walleye, we got into all this detail about you know, lateral lines and all that. We're going to look at trout and steelhead a lot more simple. I don't need to explain to you that a trout, a steelhead is an ocean run trout. You know that. You know they live in both fresh and salt. Okay, the spawning stuff, we don't really need to know that stuff. What we need to know is how do we catch them. They're confined in a river. They're easy to find. We've got to know where to look, when to fish there, what presentation to use when. Same thing for the trout. Trout's more about knowing where they're living at and then giving them something. They'll eat all kinds of things. So what we're going to do is we're going to not, it's going to be more simplified. We're going to get more into the technique about it than we are so much about you got to go here do this because I use trout will use the shoreline out to the middle the surface down so it's more about the presentation used to get them so what we'll do we'll start off with the steelhead we're gonna go do our hour and then we'll get into some trout and then what we can do for the third hour if you guys want once again if we have questions about the steelhead or the trout we can ask them if you have questions about anything we've covered during the school, feel free to ask it. If you don't, I will continue to mumble. As you know, I'm good at it. I got lots of BS in the tank. I got reserve packs on both sides here. Okay? And then we're going to have about maybe about half an hour, 15 minutes early. I got some things that I want to do for you guys. Sportsman's got some things for you guys. I want to get this stuff to you before you leave. Okay? So we'll shut her down a little early so I can give you my stuff. Okay. All right, let's get into the steelhead. Slime Rocket 101, don't say that because I'm going to get rocks thrown at me by the Puritans. Guys, steelhead. The biggest problem is we overthink it. We read the newspaper, it says average catch is one fish per 24 hours. My goodness, don't ever go again. The reason why it's one every 24 hours is because it's guys like Chad and I going down there and catching 10 or 15 a day. Just a joke. But you can. You can. Guys, I've done it for a long time. One of the biggest things that I see as a problem with the steelheading is the overthought process of it. It's not a rocket science fish. It's harder to go catch a walleye than it is a steelhead, in my opinion. They're conjugated. They're in the river. You just got to give them the right offering. Guys will get out there. They use the big atomic bobbers. Fupa! Six ounces of lead so I can cast. Gadoosh! When it hits, I got 20 pound tests floating by their face. No. No. That's the biggest problem. Steelheading is about constantly changing up, constantly changing your jig color, constantly changing your crankbait or your diver setup. Constant change. You may go out and hit a fish on a jig right off the bat, and you'll throw that all day long. Chad, when we caught seven down there and nobody was catching any, what happened every time we changed the jig color? Caught a fish. You catch a fish. So what we're going to do is go through the process. We're going to cover things loosely because I got a box over there that's got ten of every color. Do you have a box of ten every color? Probably not. You just need to understand how to put it together, how to build the right setup. I have a tackle fetish. It's gross. Okay, it's gross. So the most common fishing right now for the steelhead guys is bobber and jig. It's bobber and jig. That's the most common right now is the bobber and jig. When you go to your local sporting goods outlet, you look at the wall and you go, wow, there's a lot of bobbers there, Seth. Which one should I use? <coughs> Simplify it. Let's just take a look at two bobbers. This one you can't buy anymore. Why am I showing it to you? I don't know. I just love this little bobber. <laughs> but you can make your own. You can make your own. And you can look at this bobber here, West Coast Float. It's made out of foam. It's pretty cool. Real durable. 
Now you guys have seen the bobbers <clears throat> that are shaped like this on top. You seen those? Those are fun. Throw that out into the river and then crank it back. It's like a crankbait pulling in the current. Go, oh, I can get it back in. Whoa, do it. Two or three of those and you're tired. See how these are nice and tapered? They come through nice and easy. Well, it's pretty simple, right? Trust me. The day of throwing something that dives like a plug, you're going to be hating bobber fishing. Steel heading is about the amount of time you spend in that fish's face. 100 yard drifts, if you can do it, great. You got to crank all that back in. You go out and steelhead fish all day long and you re-spool your spinning reel 150 times with this, ah, that was enjoyable. With the diving style, not so enjoyable. Profile, tapered, retrieves easy. See here, this is the end that's floating down. What is it, it's tapered, right? Now, I know when your grandpa took you out, you had a bobber about that big, and it was cork or plastic, red on top, white on bottom. Big old bulbous thing, so you could see the bite. You don't want that. You don't want the round ones. It'll come through the water back to you nice. Problem with it is, when that steel head goes, least resistance. He's gonna chew on it for a second. He's gonna give you time to react. Something big and heavy pulling up above when he goes to pull down, feels tension, out it goes. Steel heading requires barbless hooks. A buddy of mine says barbs are made for a reason. Why do we gotta take them off? That's what we gotta do. So simple guys, don't overthink the floats. Tapered, top and bottom. Not too big on the bottom. If you're fishing faster water, you want a little bit bigger butt section on it just to keep it up as it's rocking through there. Most of the times when you're bobber fishing, if you're fishing in fast water, you're not bobber fishing. You should be side drifting, knowing what to do when. Tapered bobbers. West Coast float system. Any of these bobbers, guys, when we rig them up, so many of you do this. We got our jig. Yay, it's pretty. And we've got our bobber, Seth told me, tapered, works good. And it's tied directly to here. When we throw out, we've got a slip bobber, we've got a stopper up there, so we can set our depth to whatever we need. These are slip bobbers, line runs through. We tie a knot up above, comes in a package. It's a stopper knot, we put a bead on, and we slide our bobber on. So it basically looks like this, we've got our main line, We've got our stopper knot right in here. We've got a small bead. Then we've got our float here, stem running through, and then we tie on our jig. Everybody see that? This is what I see all the time. Bobber, bead, bobber stop. What's the bead for? The bead is for this. It's got a smaller hole. If you don't have that, that knot will go through the top of this. The other thing it does, those of you that have gray hair and glasses, because you're smart with age, okay? I'm not knocking anybody. What you can do right here, those beads that come in those packages are very small. What you can do, it must have rolled off the table, is you can take one of these corky floats, slide, tie your knot, put your small bead on, then put your corky float bead on here, Nice and big chartreuse or orange. And what happens is, when this whole rig comes together, when you throw it out, it all slides up. You'll see that corky come up to the top. You know your stuff's down on the bottom. You know it's sunk down where it needs to be. I've got Hawkeye vision. I use a small bead. It's clear. I got good eyes. It's special. Use the corky. It'll help you see it. What happens when you do this setup right here, guys? <clears throat> When you go to cast out, I'm going to make my big cast. This will come down and go bang. Like that. Goes up inside here. This thing could be floating down the river inches under the surface, right where they're at. You're in the strike zone. Cast and cast again, it's stuck up in here. We don't want that. 
So if you are one of those that likes to tie directly, which we're not going to do by the time we're done with this seminar, you have to have this to know because what will happen, this will all just be floating on the surface out here. It will be five feet, eight feet away from being up here. That tells you this jig is not sunk down yet. Other problem is, <clears throat> I see these and it's so sad. I see them, they, we're out there fishing and they go floating by you, the lone bobber. It's three quarters of a mile away from anybody. You try to save it, but you can't. You get hung up because you're fishing down low where the fish are at. You get stuck. You break it off. There's nothing here keeping that float attached, right? So now what we end up doing is wasting our time threading a bobber, threading a bead, tying it all back up again. That's lost time. So what you're going to do, you're going to go down like this. Now guys, when we're float fishing, what kind of line are we using for our main line? No, Fluorocarbon what? Sinks? We're using braid. Braid floats, right? Braid floats. Main line is always braid. I know some of you out there won't believe me. Try it. It works good. Okay, here's what you're going to do. I like to run an 8 pound. That's plenty good enough. Plenty strong enough. 8 pound fire line on my spinning reel. Remember our, our steel head lash up? We can have a bigger spinning reel because we don't need sensitivity for the float, correct? We don't have to have sensitivity. So we can run that 702, 704, 802, 803 bigger reel. We don't have to have sensitivity. The only problem happens you've got a big old reel in your hand all day, your arm's going to get tired from holding it. But you can run the bigger stuff because it's not about sensitivity. Rods, eight and a half to ten foot. Medium heavy, typically good enough. What you're going to do, you've got your bobber stopper tied on here. Here's your line. We've got our bead. We've got our corky. We've tied on our bobber. I'll move over here, guys, in just a second. And then we put on another bead, small bead, six millimeter, small bead. Then we tie on a small barrel swivel, maybe a 20 pound test, right here. And that barrel swivel is going to be flat black. Always use flat black. Don't use chrome or brass. We don't want them to see it. Nothing shiny. Now what you're going to do is you're going to come down here with which line is most invisible underwater? Yes. I like to run an 8. You can run a 10 if you feel more confident. It's fluorocarbon. They're not going to see it. I like to run a chunk of about 6 feet right here. Now what I do is I tie on my pretty little jig like so. <clears throat> I have to have that longer rod because I've got six feet of line hanging out, so it's a little awkward. If I get hung up and break, this line here is not as strong as this. So all you're breaking is this. Typically what will happen is you'll break right down here at this knot, not because you tied a bad knot, but because when you're floating down through there, it hooks on a rock, rock is sharp, so now what you're doing is you're just tying right on here, new jig, 8 to 10, 8 to 10. So that's your lash up right there, very simple. Don't use no big hurricane swivel, you don't need it. Now if you're using a jig right here that's a 3 eighths or quarter ounce, you don't put lead in here, no lead. If you're using a smaller, and that's the difference between these two bobbers, this one here I've casted the lead off. There's a piece of lead usually right underneath here on this guy. It's been casted off. With this guy, it's foam. When you use one of these foam bobbers, when you buy these West Coast floats, it's going to say on it half ounce, one ounce, three quarter ounce. Well, what does that mean? That means that if you have a half ounce and you attach a half ounce of weight, that pre-weights the float, makes it stand up, puts the water line right about here. If you don't use any weight, it's going to float down through like this, laying on its side. These guys here, you have to weight them, whether it's at 3 eighths or not. If it's a 3 eighths jig, 
and you've got a half ounce West Coast float, you don't need to put no weight on there. The jig's heavy enough. We don't use jigs that big. Chad and I use 16th ounce. We use 32nd ounce. Small stuff. Small stuff. Where do you find them that have got the strong enough hooks? We've used a lot of those small ones and they straighten them out. It's coming. Right there, a whole pile. We got them. Willis Tackle makes them. There's a fella, um, Long Feather Lures. We're going to be bringing those into our store. He's going to custom make us some colors that we want. But they're made with heavy hooks. I know what you're talking about. The small ones, the guys go out with like a crappie jig, go out and forget it. Pwah! Straight. Got to have the heavy hook. Size 2, size 4. Okay. Does it say the weight requirement on? It says it on the package. Well, or you have a memory like a trap like I do. See, I have the package right here. The top of it will say one ounce. And that's on the jig? You need to have either the jig is an ounce, which if you're using an ounce jig, that's way too big. Right. But if, you have, if you're using a quarter ounce jig, you need to have one of these guys right here that's three quarter ounce. Quarter ounce on the jig, three quarter ounce on this. Put that below the swivel? No, what you do, Brian, see how this has got swivels on both ends? This, this style here is what you're going to find at the warehouse. The ones that we run, and I didn't have any with me, they got black swivels in there. I just, I have weird fetishes about that. I don't want anything shiny down there. But what you do with these guys right here, and they say right on them what weight they are. This is a 3 8 What you would do, where you have your swivel at, you just put the weight in there. Same difference, you're just putting the weight in there. So now you've got... You've got your weight in there. You have to weight balance those floats. The nice thing about them being weight balanced is that the lightest strike, it's going to go, and it's not going to be any resistance to that fish. Now, you know why floats are, some are brown, some are white? You guys know why? When you're fishing shallow, you want to use whatever's going to blend in. If you got dark sky up above you, this one's okay. If you're fishing close to the bobber, when you're talking eight, nine, ten feet, five, it don't matter because you're far enough away from it. If you've got a bright sky and you're fishing three or four feet down, that white's going to blend in to the surrounding above. Dark day, that's going to blend in to the surrounding above. That's why your floats have the different colors like that. But that's only important if you're fishing shallow. Typically when you're fishing shallow, you're side drifting once again. You're not float fishing. You're side drifting. You're fishing riffles. Most of the time right now, you're going to be 7 feet to 12, 15 feet deep. We'll talk to you why as we get further along. I read now, because I saw this over at the show, they now have these floats where you lay the line through. Right. And it actually tightens it in there. So you can adjust it. Yeah, they have, they have built-in adjusters in there. Yep, yep. Yeah, just the fishing world keeps evolving, for sure. Yeah. Okay, guys, everybody comfortable with the floats as an overview? I mean, we could just go and go, but I want to make sure we're moving through this thing. 